Um, today, um, our speaker uh, is Justin Webster uh, from UMBC, but before we had to starting at a talk and everything, so uh, I'm going to uh, just send you a poll uh, to ask about uh, what topic or what field of applied math would you be interested uh, for full 2021 uh, talks. So I'm going to launch the polling, please uh, respond that um, so that we can get some feedback from you guys before we start. Do I get a vote? Sure. <laughs> I know what you're going to pick. <laughs> when I give polls in my classes, I always vote and I always pick the ridiculous choice. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we have like uh, DFEQ leading currently. Um, okay, so yeah, that, that's going to be something helpful for us <laughs> the speakers. Wow, control is so like getting head to head. Awesome. Okay, good. All right, so. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm not going to take this long. I'm just going to take it over all the way to Avery. Avery is going to introduce our speaker all the way. So go ahead, Avery. So uh, you're the boss now. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for coming to our talk today. So our speaker today is really cool. And I'm really excited to hear from him. So he started in physics and pure mathematics, and he wanted to go into a quantum topology, which um, over my head um, when he went to University of Virginia, but he ended up um, going into functional analysis and um, pursued that for his PhD. So he's been working on fluid structure system interactions for about 10 years. Um, and he'll be talking specifically about flutter systems today. Um, he's done a bunch of postdocs and he ended up in Baltimore as you may have heard him talking about. Um, he's currently an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And he does modeling um, and analysis of applied PDE systems. And he also uh, has got NSF grants. And as you can see, he's just a really nice dude. Um, and he enjoys running and urban bird watching, which if we have more time, I'm more, I'm very interested to hear about. But yeah, so take it away, Dr. Justin Webster. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the, the invite. Um, and uh, I, I will say, I, the, um, I haven't given a talk exactly in the format as you guys uh, laid out. So I have some slides about um, I have some slides about lots of things, uh, and I promise I won't take too long because it's Friday afternoon, um, but we can definitely let the, the if you guys have questions or interest, we can let that dictate which direction we, we go in. So um, let me share. Oh, yeah, and, and actually, my one of my research students is here, uh, Caitlin Lilly. I won't make her introduce herself, but, um, but a lot of the work I'm going to be talking about uh, is relevant to what she's working on. Okay, can you see that? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So, so again, I've given a version of this talk where the main focus is actually on this bridge problem. Uh, and so um, I cut down the slides by a factor of two. So it's not a, a big mathy talk with lots of crazy stuff. Um, but I do still want to focus on this problem because I think it's a nice illustration of what of what I do. Uh, and I, I know uh, that it's similar to what Professor Ozer does as well, in that we're interested in some real phenomenon that exists in the world. And then we try and use mathematics to, to model that phenomenon and try and explain you know, what's going on, to learn something about the actual real world. So uh, along the way, you'll get to hear my thoughts on, on what applied math is. Uh, and hopefully you'll find that my definition of applied math is very inclusive and not exclusive. Um, okay. Okay, so just want to acknowledge a bunch of stuff. So there's been various funding. Um, UMBC has supported lots of my students in the past. NSF is supporting Caitlin, uh, the student who's here. Uh, and I have a list of, of collaborators here uh, going all the way back to, to grad school. Um, I will point out for this project, all of the numerical work, uh, well, not all, there's not that much, but any of the numerical work that you see uh, was done by students and by my collaborator, Jason Howell, who's at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University. Uh, and then I have two students right now who are roughly speaking working on this flutter stuff. Uh, one is Caitlin, who's here, uh, and the other is Maria, who will be uh, graduating uh, next year. Uh, I mean, she'll be finishing her dissertation. Uh, okay, so just a couple things about me, um, just so that I seem normal. I'm not, but I'll try and make it seem like I am. Uh, so I grew up uh, in a rural area outside of Portland in Oregon. Um, I went to college at the University of San Diego, and then I just got this cool new sweatshirt, so I'm representing. Um, and uh, I studied uh, math and physics. I put physics in quotes because uh, I was always interested in physics. As was mentioned earlier, I thought I wanted to do quantum topology, even though I had no idea what that was. Uh, but it turns out that to finish your physics major, you have to take a whole bunch of labs. Uh, and in my last year of undergrad, I just decided to mix the labs and took more math classes. So I have like 95% of a physics major, uh, but I didn't finish it. Um, but, but this will explain, so, so even though I didn't end up doing uh, quantum topology, 
uh, my interest really lies at the intersection of, of sort of engineering principles, uh, physics, and, and math. And, and so at the time, I didn't realize that there are branches of mathematics that allow you to kind of have one foot in, in each world. And that's, that's where my, my interests are. Um, so I just had different phases of my life. Uh, I played ultimate Frisbee for a long time. That was sort of my, my thing through grad school. And then I retired about 10 years after, uh, after college. Um, and then I, I do, I do run. Um, but this bird watching thing is connected to what we were talking about before the, the talk, the Baltimore has this really robust, uh, system of urban, uh, trails and, and sort of, um, green spaces. Uh, and so when the birds migrate, uh, which I didn't know anything about till a couple of years ago, they like to stop in Baltimore because it's, it's this big urban area with these little concentrated green spaces. So, uh, there are a bunch of people from like surrounding states that travel to the city of Baltimore to look at birds. And so it just turns out that they all come to my neighborhood. So I've been learning a lot about birds by watching the people who watch birds. Um, I, I got my PhD, uh, in, in, uh, math at the university of Virginia. Really, I would consider myself to be an applied mathematician, but um, but my degree is actually in math, math, math. Um, I started out, as was stated earlier, I was interested in uh, topology uh, and what I thought topology was, and this is my first piece of advice for the students, or I won't even call it advice, I won't say it that strongly, but my first comment is that often if you, if you go to grad school, you have a very strong idea of what you think you like, but it's not until you get through that first year of grad school that you even know what any of anything is. Um, and so I just caution you be open minded because what I thought was topology at the University of Virginia, which is a strong place with lots of topologists, turns out was not very close at all to what the people were doing there. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons which precipitated my, my shift away from uh, topology. Um, so yeah, so then of course in academia, if you're interested in going that route, you know, you finish your PhD. Um, and then you, you do a lot of stops along the way, figuring out what sort of job you, you want, what sort of job you can get. Um, so I did some postdocs uh, at, at big, big state schools, research places. Uh, I had an assistant professorship at a small college um, for a while, and then I ended up at UMBC, and I'm very happy at UMBC. I like it there. So we, I'll talk about UMBC at the end a little bit, but we do have, um, we do have a PhD program. So we're kind of the perfect uh, uh, we're big enough that we have a PhD program and we have resources uh, and we have lots of faculty, but we're small enough that we still get to know our students and we're not overburdened. Our class sizes are still pretty small, um, especially for our grad classes. So uh, when I do my promo at the end, uh, I'll talk more about that. that. Um, yeah, and, and the uh, well, other thing I wanted to point out too, if, if you're thinking about academia as a, as a way of life, um, it's not the, the highest paying profession, uh, and there are things about it which are difficult and frustrating, but as the professors here will attest to, it does give you a lot of uh, sort of tangential opportunities, and one of those is travel. Um, so if you're an active researcher, uh, you, you, whether you're funded or not, you, you will have lots of opportunities to travel and do work with collaborators from lots of different countries, lots of, lots of different states. Um, and a lot of the time, um, there's money available for you to travel. So if someone invites you to come give a talk, they may have a budget in their seminar, and they can pay for you to come visit a city you've never been to for a couple of days. And that's how I've been able to, being a social mathematician, I've been able to see a lot of the United States and a lot of other countries that I probably otherwise wouldn't have, have gone to. Um, okay, so that uh, the rest of this talk. So uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about my view on applied math. And it's just my view. It's not some sort of absolute thing. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce a, a phenomenon that is uh, very near and dear to my heart, which is Flutter, funny name. Um, and then uh, I'll try and talk a little bit about what, what the branch of mathematics I'm in tries to say about this actual phenomenon of Flutter. And, and I'll do that through this bridge, bridge Flutter problem. Um, my disclaimers are as follows. Uh, I will be talking about differential equations. And so I say it's always difficult to talk about differential equations in mixed company. Um, the, uh, the talk will feature lots of things from lots of different branches of math, but nothing too crazy. And I can tell my story more or less with like one equation. Um, so so it, it will have math and I will say some things um, that are beyond calculus. But at the end of the day, if you know what a derivative is, you should be okay uh, with, with my story. I promise there will be pictures and movies. Uh, and my hope is just that, you know, when we leave here uh, in, you know, 30 minutes, whatever it is, uh, that you may have an understanding of this phenomenon flutter that you didn't have before. And if we accomplish that, then we're, we're good to go. So I drew this class uh, for my, uh, I drew this picture 
um, for the, the first time that I taught uh, partial differential equations. And I don't have tech skills like Dr. Ozer uh, to, to be able to actually like do magic things on the computer. So I hand drew this. Um, but, but just uh, if you take a second to look at this, this is sort of how I organize um, I don't know, all of science. This is like the epistemology of my brain. Uh, so there are phenomena in the world, uh, those over here, we wanna study them. So we try and produce some sort of model. That model can be discrete or continuous. Usually uh, you can move between the discrete and continuous, right? So there's no preference here. It's, it's just that you, you, your model can be either or, or both. Uh, and then you sort of have two ways you can go with your model, right? You can try and formulate some experiments from that model perhaps numerical experiments or, or others, uh, or you can try and develop theory from that model. I tend to, to be more down here. I, I take a given differential equation model and I try and develop some theory that will allow me to answer questions. Uh, and then I made this distinction here at the bottom, which you can see where I put, it says apply, oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, sorry, I just wanted that thing at the bottom to go away, but anyway. Um, so with theory, the, the two ways I distinguish is uh, it's, it's still applied mathematics to take existing theory and apply it to a new model. That's one way you can do this. Or if you're given a model and there's no theory available, then you can be a pioneer and you can develop theory for that model. In my view, neither is superior to the other. And I have certainly done my fair share of both of them. Um, so, uh, and then from there, uh, what I call the analysis step is where you relate back to the original thing you were trying to study. So you've done all of this hard work and you ask, well, did we actually capture the phenomenon we were trying to study? Or if there's a specific research question you're trying to answer, why did the bridge fall down? At the end of the day, you can say, well, did our theory give us a good explanation as to why the bridge fell down? Okay, and I'm gonna leave this up here. I apologize, there is a bad word in this comic, but it's not too bad. Um, so I just leave, there's two, two panes in this comic. I'll leave the first one, uh, first one up. So I said, this was my, my view uh, 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 pure versus applied math. Okay, everybody through the first part. Okay, so. <laughs> So the, the punchline here is my, is my true belief that uh, all, all math is applied math eventually. Uh, and I really like this comic because it, it, it strikes at the heart of that, even though it's a little bit out there. Um, oops. Okay, cool. So, so just in summary, uh, again, with this whole applied math thing. So like, I, I, again, I take an inclusive view. There are people out there who have very strong opinions about what, what applied math is and isn't. And this matters, for instance, if you're applying for a job, uh, or if you're applying for a grant, uh, because people exist with very strong opinions about what qualifies and what doesn't. And in my view, basically, if you want to call it applied, it is because, it, you know, for instance, if you're doing math and you can apply that math to other branches of math, that's an application of math. So call it applied, whatever. Um, so that's 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 my view. Uh, now bringing it down to a more specific level, uh, the, the models I like to work on are, are um, differential equations models. So I wanted to just put on this slide two. Um, I don't know, canonical example. So the first one, I, I think, I hope most of you have seen, if not, that's okay. Um, so this is uh, taught in a lot of physics classes. Uh, it's taught in, um, sometimes it's discussed in calculus classes, uh, but it's certainly discussed in differential equations classes. So this is the harmonic oscillator. Um, and in this case, we allow for some damping. Uh, so basically all this is, is a restatement of Newton's second law applied to uh, like, let's say a mass spring system. So you have a mass attached to the spring and you, you perturb it and it oscillates up and down. And so in this example, Y of T would be the displacement of the block um, or mass or whatever is, is oscillating. Y prime would be the velocity, right? Just from calc one and Y double prime would be the acceleration. So right here, you can see this is mass times acceleration. And if I swing these two other terms to the, to the right hand side, this is some version of Newton's second law. Um, okay, so this is this is a damped oscillator uh, that you would see in, in physics or whatever. So I wanted to show you a partial differential equation version, um, and it's not the same system, it's not the same equation, uh, but it's a, it's a very related uh, differential equation. So this is a partial differential equation because there are two different notions of differentiation, right? There are time derivatives, 
uh, corresponding to the rate of change in time of the displacement. Uh, and there are spatial derivatives, which is to say that instead of looking at a mass spring system where in space you're, you're localized and this thing is just moving up and down, now what you can think of is you can think of some sort of bar and that bar is moving up and down or beam. Uh, and so at each position in space, it has the, the possibility of moving up and down. And therefore, as you move from left to right, you can have changes in space, changes in the deflection with respect to space. You can also have changes in time. Um, so that's what makes it a, a partial differential equation. And I did use some notation from Calc 3. If there's anybody here who hasn't had Calc 3, I apologize. But I tried to explain it's just two different notions of, of differentiation, differentiating with respect to time, differentiating with respect to space. Um, OK, so you'll see why this is relevant here uh, in a second. So without doing any more math for the time being, let me show you a cheesy video uh, from, uh, I think it's from the 80s, uh, maybe the 70s. It's a NASA video. Um, and what, I, what this video does is it just shows you in real time a bunch of different uh, uh, versions of flutter. And so I gave the definition in words of flutter. And then there's this very dramatic picture of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Uh, but rather than dwell on the, the definition, I think it's better just to show you the uh, show you the video. So let's do this, let's see what the computer does. Crack. Can you guys see the movie? Okay. We'll give it a second. Okay. I personally I have to, can't see it. Yeah, I think what I have to do is, ah, we'll fix it. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to reshare my whole screen. Okay, so um, there is there is really cool uh, music for this too. Okay. Oh no, the music is playing without connected to any. Okay. Share again. And share. A demonstration propeller model uh -oh. illustrates propeller whirl instability. Stop. Okay, I've stopped sharing, but now I can't find where the sound is coming from. Oh, here we go. Hey, stiff. There you go. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, good. Go back here. All right, I have some more videos later, but they don't have sound, so we should be fine. Uh, okay, so so that's Flutter. So so um, in in the words that I wrote up here, uh, it's a systemic instability in a flow structure system. Um, so it's not a structural instability. It's not a fluid or flow instability. It's somehow the coupling between the two. So in the case of the bridge, right, the presence of the wind uh, on the particular fateful day uh, uh, interacted with the oscillations or vibrations of the bridge in a very very particular way, 
uh, which, which brought down the, the bridge. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a second. But this first uh, little overview is just all of the different, or many of the different manifestations of this particular type of uh, flow structure instability. And as you saw, right, one of the things that is frequently tested for among uh, aircraft, right, is exactly the flutter phenomenon. So you want to make sure that when planes are flying, uh, that their wings and tails uh, are not are not fluttering. And fortunately, most of the things you saw where, where, where wings or tails snapped and broke, those were simulations, right, or, or wind tunnel tests. They were not actual planes. Um, so it's a good thing. Uh, all right, so just some, some basics about uh, the, the flutter phenomenon. So um, this part, uh, I will talk a little bit about linear algebra and, um, and differential equations. So uh, when you learn, I guess, in a physics class early on or, or in a, a class like ODEs, you talk about resonance. And um, there's an interesting little anecdote here, which is that for about 30 or 40 years, uh, there were a lot of physics books that described what happened to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, the bridge that wobbled and fell down, as being a classic example of resonance. And so without giving away my opinion on the matter, uh, I will point out in my first bullet that flutter, flutter is not resonance. Uh, and, and this is often confusing. And in fact, it is confusing. It takes a long time to actually, it's a subtle, subtle distinction, but we will definitely talk about that later on. So what I'm calling flutter uh, is, uh, is not something which is due to a periodic forcing. So traditional resonance that you learn about in a differential equations class, like an opera singer singing into a, a glass and the glass shatters. This is where you have a natural frequency of an object. You have a forced frequency. And if the natural and forced frequency are close enough, uh, then this thing starts to resonate and eventually it will, the oscillations will grow unboundedly and the thing will break. Um, so that, that would be traditional resonance and my claim is that flutter is not that. Um, the second sort of major bullet point about flutter is that if you want to predict when it occurs, that is a linear problem. So that would be something that you could study in the context of a linear algebra class. Um, and you, you're predominantly looking at the stability of some eigenvalues. So if you know what eigenvalues are, uh, what I've written down here is sort of just a fancy way of, of asking the question, uh, do you have stable or unstable eigenvalues for your system? Okay, the, the actual qualitative properties of flutter, if you wanna know what flutter looks like after it has occurred, uh, that's a nonlinear problem. Um, and so this is a big distinction from the point of view of modeling and from the point of view of analysis. If all you wanna do is predict when it happens, or if you wanna say that it won't happen, that's linear theory and can be done with linear differential equations. But if you wanna know what it looks like and you wanna describe it qualitatively, that is nonlinear theory. And as you know, in all branches of mathematics, right? Nonlinear things are harder than linear things. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Th there's probably some branch of mathematics where that's not the case, but for most branches of mathematics, nonlinear problems are harder than linear problems. Um, Okay, cool. <clears throat> um, so what I wanted to do here, um, remind me, were we supposed to, we're supposed to talk for 30 minutes and then do questions, is that right? Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this then because I have a bunch of videos, but basically all these videos are, are uh, I can summarize. The, this is a differential equation model. It's very similar to the beam that I showed you with a couple of other effects. So all I demonstrate with this sequence of videos is that I can reproduce the, the flutter phenomenon from this differential equation. So as long as you'll allow me, uh, as long as you'll take me at my word uh, that I can make this beam oscillate using this differential equation, then we don't need to watch five minutes worth of pretty boring videos. Um, just and also take your time, by the way, it could be 35 or 40 minutes, just, just so you know, I mean, it's, oh, yeah, it's, no, not, it it's like sharp 30 minutes, we're going to start QA session. So, just, well, just yeah, so no, no, it's, it's Friday. So we got to, <laughs> I want to, I want to tell the bridge story. And if I can get the bridge story done, then, then we're good. So mm -hmm. um, the last thing I'll point out here is uh, there are lots of different um, problems associated to flutter. So I just wanted to list a few. So uh, here, what you have, this is a cantilever. Uh, so it's, it's clamped on one end and free on the other. This is what I'm calling the panel configuration. Um, it could be, uh, it could be clamped or hinged or whatever, doesn't matter. Um, but there are a lot of classical problems. So if you take the cantilever and you allow the fluid flow to go into the computer screen, then that would be your classic airfoil problem, right? So if you look at the oscillations of the cantilever with normal flow, where the fluid flow is into the computer screen, um, that would be the stability of an airfoil or a plane wing. Um, if you want uh, to look at the stability of a bridge, right, you have two, two choices, right? You could have wind flowing along the deck of the bridge. Uh, so that would be in this picture here where you see the, the fluid velocity, which is axial, right, in the direction of the span of the bridge. Um, 
I said that backwards, uh, this would be the cross section of the bridge. Um, but in either case, what you can do is you can break these problems into the direction of the flow uh, and what the boundary conditions are uh, for the for the elastic object. So what I want to focus on for us is is again the bridge problem. Um, so what we're going to be thinking of in the following slides is we're going to be thinking of uh, the wind blowing orthogonally to the deck of the bridge. So like this bridge span is here, cars drive back and forth this way, and the wind is going to be blowing along the, the direction of the water, which was the actual uh, situation for the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Okay, so here it is. You've already seen the video. I don't need to, to re-show it. Um, so let me just briefly tell you the story of, of what happened. So this was supposed to be, at the time, uh, I, I believe it was the second longest uh, span, maybe even the first longest span that had ever been completed. Uh, so Tacoma Narrows is this very broad stretch, and it's in the Seattle area, Tacoma area. And it was taking people, I think, three and a half hours to drive from the city around uh, this sort of island area to get to the other side. Um, and so they proposed to build this bridge and they were gonna make it a toll bridge, make a lot of money, um, but it was a very long span. Uh, and this was around 1940. And so there was no computer modeling. There was no FEM, there was no nonlinear theory. And in fact, uh, for those of you that know something about beams and plates, uh, von Karman himself was called in after the bridge collapsed to help explain what happened. Uh, so, um, so, so a lot of the theory that we use now, which describes the nonlinear oscillations of beams and plates are named after the guy who they brought in after the thing fell down. And if they'd only brought him in beforehand, then maybe it would be different. But this is a very interesting story. Lots of books have been written about it. Um, and von Karman's autobiography, he talks about it a lot. So the, the, here's the conundrum. As an applied mathematician, as an applied scientist, as an engineer, you build this bridge. From day one, after you complete the span, the bridge is unstable. Okay, but the way in which it's unstable is that it oscillates longitudinally, which means it bounces up and down. And we've all been on bridges before when cars are passing or when it's windy and the bridge moves up and down and it's a little disconcerting, but bridges are designed to handle that type of behavior, right? And so the thing that was disconcerting for them is they did not expect it to bounce as much as it did or as often as it did. So, so I'm going to use the word bounce just to delineate from what's going to happen here at the latter part of the story. So this thing for something like 40 or 50 days, um, it does its thing. It just bounces up and down. Cars are driving over it. Um, they're concerned about it, of course, because their models didn't predict it. And they're trying to find solutions to, to minimize this or cause this not to happen. But meanwhile, of course, while they're trying to find solutions on one fateful day, for no explicable reason, the bridge, instead of moving up and down, uh, and, and I should also point out that the wind velocities that day were not anything special. They weren't much greater than they had been. They weren't much less than they had been. The only key is that they were sustained. So the wind velocities were pretty close to a constant 40 miles per hour, uh, which, you know, gusts, 40 mile per hour gust is not a huge thing. It's not like a hurricane gale force wind, but it was a sustained 40 mile an hour wind. The bridge is oscillating up and down like it's done for a couple months. And then suddenly the bridge switches to torsional motion, right? And so instead of moving up and down, the bridge starts to twist. After it starts to twist, it exhibits all sorts of different behaviors uh, in some sort of unpredictable way. So it twists with a few nodal points, then it has more nodal points, then it goes back to longitudinal motion. It's basically just doing all sorts of dances uh, and it lasts about 45 minutes before it falls down. Um, and the good thing is that we do have video of, of this sequence of events. The bad news is that the film technology, there are three known videos of this occurring um, and they all have different frame rates and uh, there's no consensus on the actual real-time behavior, namely the actual frequencies that these things were oscillating at, uh, which leads to the conundrum, which I'm about to describe to you. So, uh, so our job as modelers or, or, or mathematicians or engineers or whatever is to figure out what happened, right? And the primary question um, is not so much why the bridge bounced up and down. We have good explanations for that. The big question is why on that particular day did the behavior switch from longitudinal to torsional? Um, so, so again, up and down versus twisting. Twisting is bad. Concrete is not designed to handle it. If a bridge twists, it will fall down. Bouncing up and down, not a big deal. Um, so I just wrote here, uh, from my point of view, like, what is the research question here? Uh, and uh, this is a 70, 80 year old research question. Um, so choose some sort of bridge model, which includes the aerodynamics of the bridge and the elasticity. 
determine what causes the flutter behavior to go from longitudinal to torsional, use analytical or numerical methods to predict when this will occur so that when you build bridges, you can make sure that this won't occur again. Um, and then mathematically, one of the things we might try to do is construct a solution to the differential equation that has the properties that we observed uh, in, the, in the actual bridge. All right, so let's let's talk about the um, the uh, uh, fight, so to speak, the 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 contention. This is still contentious to this day. You will find people that disagree about this. So this is the the classical cause and effect reversal. So the original claim uh, as to why the bridge went down is that this was resonance. What caused the resonance is a phenomenon known as vortex shedding. And this is a hypothesis. So I'm not saying this is my opinion. I'm just giving you uh, one theory. So one theory is that the bridge, when it's stationary, acts as a bluff body. When wind passes over a bluff body in certain ranges of, of uh, wind velocities, it will shed vortices. And these are now, nowadays we refer to these as von Karman vortices. Um, so basically uh, at a certain range of frequencies, when you, when you push wind against a, an object that has corners or even an object which is round, um, it, will, it will build up owing to the forces of friction, some sort of vorticity, that vorticity gets shed, right? It gets released. And you can see this in this picture down here in a periodic way. So let's say every 10 or 15 seconds a vortex forms and is released. Well, as we know, like these vortices have mass, they have inertia. And so when they're shed, that induces a force on the bridge, right? So as the bridge releases the vortex, then there is an equal and opposing force on the bridge, which might cause the bridge to move. And so each time one of these vortices is shed, it causes the bridge to, let's say, tilt a little bit. But as soon as the bridge starts to tilt, it has an angle of attack with respect to the, the uh, leading edge uh, velocity, right? So it becomes a wing. And if it becomes a wing, then it has lift. So then that pushes it further down, at which point the elastic restoring forces bring it back up. Now it's an airfoil in this direction. So it goes up, but then the elastic restoring forces bring it back down. And so the initial uh, hypothesis was that this procedure led to a resonance, right? A periodic forcing, which was acting at the, let's say, natural frequency of the bridge. And uh, eventually with resonance, of course, the, the glass breaks, or, you know, the, the swing goes over the bar. Uh, and so the hypothesis was that this vortex shedding led to led to resonance and brought the bridge down. So our contention is in fact that that is not what happened. And I say this like it's mine, like people have been arguing about this for, like I said, 80 years. So, um, so what we believe is instead of uh, resonance due to vortex shedding, we actually believe um, that this is due to flutter, right? Which is a different phenomenon. And, and flutter is, uh, is something as I talked about before, which has nothing to do with viscosity. It has nothing to do with vortices. Uh, it's a self destabilization that can basically happen to any structure that is placed in, in wind flow. So um, as, math, as an applied mathematician, my goal is to try and demonstrate that this, there we go. Oops, oh no. I lost my, my screen here. Um, there we go, okay. Um, so uh, my job is to, to try and say that this was in fact an example of, of flutter. So how might I do that? There we go. Um, so the way I would do that is again uh, to write down a very simple, uh, very simple partial differential equation model. It's not; it doesn't look that simple uh, to the untrained eye, but this is just a, a fancier, sexier version of the um, of the one-dimensional model I showed before. Uh, and then, you know, we try and prove some try and prove some theorems about it. Uh, so before I wrap this up, I just wanted to show you uh, an example of an actual theorem like you guys would learn in your, your math classes uh, that we proved about the differential equation model I just showed you. And what this theorem is trying to do is it's trying to give some sort of description of the, of the dynamics of the, of the system uh, and to try to sort of unpack bit by bit uh, what's actually going on. Now, this, this theorem does not in any way answer the question that I posed earlier, but this is a stepping stone towards an answer to that, um, that question. So I won't go into the technical details about this, but this, this theorem is a dynamical systems uh, theorem, and we use a lot of different methods uh, to prove a, a, a theorem like this. And I think this is somewhat recent. Yeah, it's a couple, couple years ago. So, um, okay, cool. Oops. Yeah. I'm gonna skip this. Uh, I just wanted to show you a fancy slide, but um, what I wanted to do then uh, is just uh, briefly give um, us a couple couple words about what we're trying to do now. So that theorem's already proved, right? So it's 
it's out there in the world. Um, so what are we working on now, for instance, with Caitlin? Um, well, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to create simulations of a two-dimensional model. So that would be like write code, which will actually produce a visualization of the solution. So we want to be able to watch the bridge dynamic. So if we change a parameter, we can press play and produce a, a simulation. Uh, and a lot of differential equations uh, analysts, people who do what I do, like to use simulations as a tool because it's a nice way to actually see what's going on with your, with your dynamics. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the things we're trying to prove, we're trying to prove that this sophisticated model has periodic solutions. Uh, turns out this is very hard um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so we're trying to use fixed point methods, but um, I'm not sure that we will be successful anytime soon. Uh, one of the other things we might want to do, if any of you know anything about fluid mechanics, is uh, our, our fluid models thus far have been very simple. Uh, so we might try to refine them by using something like Navier-Stokes, which is not very simple. Um, so we can increase the integrity of our model by choosing to swap out one of the components of the model with a better component. Now, the reason why we don't do that from the beginning is because some models are very difficult to study. So we don't start with this hard millennium problem fluid flow model because it's very difficult to study and it has its own problems associated to it. So what we do is we throw that model away, use a gross oversimplification and start there because then maybe we can actually say something sensible. Um, and this is, what, this is what everybody does. Engineers do this too. This is not just a dirty trick that us PDE people do. Uh, and then uh, one of the other things that we'd like to do in the future, maybe with a, another undergraduate after uh, Caitlin graduates and moves away, um, would be to try and incorporate the uh, effect of the actual cables of the bridge. One of the, one of the hypotheses, uh, which I didn't talk about, as to why the bridge switched from longitudinal to torsional is very simple. It's that it oscillated long enough that there was fatigue in the cables, and one of the cables snapped. And so if it, so if it just bounced up and down long enough, and the cables weren't really uh, geared for that, then if one of the cables snapped, it would create an asymmetric loading on the bridge deck, which would allow the bridge to have some sort of natural oscillatory motion. So one of the things we might consider doing is actually try and capture the cables in our um, in our model. So, all right, and, and I'll, um, I'll try and wrap up. If you guys have questions, we can go back, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to say a couple words um, about UMBC. Uh, so um, so uh, just so you know, if you're thinking about places where you might want to go to grad school, uh, we have a, a wonderful active PhD program. We have a lot of master's students, some of whom are supported, some of whom are unsupported, um, but we are, we're not small, right? So we have 30 faculty, around 50 grad students and lots of good, uh, good majors. In our PhD group, we have three types of researchers. We have PDE people, which is how I would consider myself, Dr. Ozer as well. We have numerical analysts, computational people, and then we have optimization uh, people. One of the biggest benefits of coming to UMBC, if you were interested for your PhD or master's, uh, is that we have a lot of good relationships with nearby uh, organizations, Army, Navy, various DOD, uh, NSA, a lot of our students go to work for the NSA. Um, and we're also just in the, the general DMV region. So there's lots and lots of opportunities. So that's one of the big, big draws um, for, our, for our program. And then this is a, a picture of our, of our mascot. Uh, I think his name is True Grit and he's a Chesapeake Bay, Bay Retriever. So, uh, all right, I'll stop talking. So let me unshare. Okay. That cool. was a wonderful talk, yeah. Um, and I was only 10 minutes over. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was awesome. Did, were you trying to play a few videos along the way that, that we, we didn't see those videos for the for The only stuff? video you should have seen was the, uh, was the actual one with funny music. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I skipped the other ones. I, I just narrated them. Sure, okay. Um, yeah, Avery, so you're the boss, so you're the moderator. So uh, I think we're going to pass to the QA session and Avery is going to lead that, so yeah. Yeah, no, I'm totally open to opening the floor for questions. I have a lot of different questions myself living next to one of the worst bridges in America, the Brent Spence Bridge, just to plug it. But um, yeah, so does anyone have any questions that come to mind immediately? They don't have to be about the, the bridge problem, but we can talk about whatever. I got all the time in the world. Um, what type of numerical analysis? Um, not numerical approximation techniques to use. I'm I'm working with Dr. Ozer and so far I've got to um, work with finite element and finite difference. So yeah, yeah, we've okay. So finite differences are great for beams. 
Um, and uh, and so if you're, I'm, I'm assuming you're probably working on beans, uh, knowing our mutual friend here. Uh, that uh, but finite differences are are great, and they're um, they're really they're really straightforward in the sense that you know an undergraduate can pick them up, but they're also still used at really high levels too, and have nice error estimates. So we when we generate our little movies, we we do use finite differences. Um, the other is that me or is that somebody else? These simulations help scientists and engineers. Uh, it's probably me. The underlying physics of gas. Something in the background. Videos want to be played. They have a mind of their own. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, that was a CFD simulation that I in no way meant to show. Okay, um, but uh, okay. So we also use spectral uh, spectral simulations, um, and and I, I didn't talk about them because it would have taken more time. But basically, uh, what you can do is uh, when you do finite elements, uh, when you've done finite elements, you you're um, you're choosing a particular basis in space uh, for which you want to base your simulations on. Um, and so another way you could do that instead of choosing a particular class of polynomials is you can choose eigenfunctions. Uh, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. They're special functions which are tailored to the problem at hand. Uh, and they have not lots of nice theoretical properties and, and error estimates and, and whatnot. So a lot of our simulations are spectral in nature. Um, and uh, and we have not yet gone down the road of finite elements, but my collaborator at Carnegie Mellon is a, is a finite elements person. Um, so he definitely is capable. I'm not. Uh, I know I know the theory of finite elements and I teach it in PDEs, but if you ask me if I've ever actually implemented it, the answer is no. <laughs> but it's really cool that you, you have uh, experience with more than one. That's awesome. And that'll look really good for grad applications, if that's what you're going to do. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, definitely looking at becoming a math professor as well. So PhD eventually. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. I personally thought it was interesting. I was looking at your website that you had um, the NSF grant to um, explore flag flutter. Can you talk more about that? Sure, I, I cut that whole thing out uh, because I knew I wouldn't have time from, so the flag flutter is, is a kind of a, a euphemism for, for what, okay, so I don't actually study flags. There are people who do study flags, um, but flags flags are typically modeled as membranes uh, and, and so they don't have stiffness, right? Like a, a flag, when, when it's not blowing in the wind, it's just draped. Uh, I tend to study things that have stiffness, so that would be like a, a cantilever, like a beam in a flag configuration. Um, and so one of the, uh, I really appreciate this question because almost all of the applications of Flutter are, are negative, right? So, so Flutter generally is something you want to uh, stop from happening, or once it happens, you want to use control theory to stop it from continuing to, to happen. Um, but the uh, piezoelectric energy harvesting uh, is, a, is a particular application where you want Flutter to occur. Uh, so just the basic idea, uh, uh, and again, Dr. Ozer is an expert on piezoelectrics as well, but the general idea is that um, if you take a beam and you put it in this cantilever configuration, so instead of having the wind blow orthogonal to it, you have the wind blow along its length, you can get it to flap wildly very easily, right? So that's where we think about flags, right? Flags, it's easy to make them flap. So then if you take your, your flapping beam and you attach piezoelectric devices, then if you place this someplace, let's say in a remote desert where there's lots of wind, and let's say you put a whole bunch of these on a pole, then the, the oscillations which they generate, if they have piezoelectrics attached, might actually generate enough power that you could you know, turn on some lights or charge your iPhone. So this is not proposed to be some sort of uh, alternative energy revolution. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there is a possibility of an application where you could actually create something, have it flutter, and then try and extract power from it uh, from sort of just ambient wind or ambient uh, flow. Interesting question for those of you that are physics oriented. Uh, so I used to use this example uh, and then I got called out on it. And so I'll have you think about why this is a bad example. Um, so what I used to say is I used to say, okay, imagine that you could you know, do this, you could have a flapping beam. And um, let's say it was on the order of like centimeters instead of meters. I used to say, well, what you could do is you could attach a bunch of them to your person when you're riding your bike. Uh, and then, you know, as you're riding your bike, the wind that you generate could, you know, charge your iPhone. Um, and so I had a, a physics person in the audience at one of these talks who pointed out that this is in violation of one of the fundamental uh, principles. So, so in other words, uh, that example is maybe bad because uh, you're the one generating the wind. Uh, and, and as they say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, so you just have to be careful about how you create applications uh, for, for such things. But in a situation where the wind is blowing, right, you're not paying anything for that wind. And so if you stick them in the wind, then you can actually extract energy for free. 
I don't know if I answered your question, but I babbled. No, it's really cool. Like almost like a novelty, like smaller scale wind turbine, I guess. Not really, obviously, like different principles, but like some sort of energy that's created by wind. I, yeah. I think that's really cool. Well, and, and if you know anything about turbines, just to, to, to dovetail, like one of the big, so for, for an applied math or engineer problem, right, you have this concept, right? So the first thing you'd want to demonstrate is you'd want to demonstrate that you can actually do this. But as soon as you can demonstrate that it can be done, the question is like scalability, right? And so with, with, with wind, uh, there's an expert at Johns Hopkins uh, who actually studies uh, wind turbines and their layout. And, and so this is a very mathematical question, right? It, it, it can't be solved by engineering principles because you cannot necessarily build a thousand prototypes at extremely high cost, right? So what you need is you need a viable mathematical model, let's say for, for a wind farm, right? Like you can't just experimentally build a hundred different wind farms on huge pieces of property where each turbine costs millions of dollars, right? So you have to write down some math and make a decision about what you're gonna build before you actually do it. And this is, this is why applied mathematics matters, right? So in some situations you can just build it and see what happens, but in a lot of situations uh, you, you can't, so. seeing a question in the chat about your ultimate frisbee experience yeah. okay what was it was it just in general or was it more specific uh oh okay uh yeah yeah that would be interesting uh to to i never really thought about the uh aerodynamics of the of the disc when i was when i was playing uh frisbee no i, I played frisbee from 2004 until uh oh wow until like, I don't know, 2016 or something. Um, but I was on some some pretty good teams. So when I was in college, well, we were crummy uh, and I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was decent. Uh, and then when I went to grad school, uh, I actually, I made the team at UVA and I had one more year of eligibility and uh, and we were, we were quite good. Uh, we made it to, to nationals. And then I played um, on some mixed teams uh, in the club club scene for a while. Uh, and then I and then I retired because the it was too too hip for me. I lost all my coolness and I had to do something more boring like bird watching. Uh, but uh, there was something else I was going to say about frisbee. Um, yeah, I don't I don't remember. But anyway, there's a good question. I appreciate it. Putting the piezo electrodes on frisbees and generating power by throwing the frisbees. <laughs> Frisbee yeah, no. here. One thing I can babble on about, uh, I had a physics professor um, who I really liked uh, in, in college who used to talk about how, uh, and he knew that I liked Frisbee. Um, so if you can describe how a Frisbee flies and how a bike rides, then you are a extremely gifted uh, scientist, physicist, mathematician. These are extremely difficult things to describe. And so we all take them for granted because we just grow up throwing Frisbees. Um, but like, if you actually sit down from first principles and try and break down why they fly, and this leads uh, not so much for the bike, but more for the Frisbee to uh, another interesting question is, um, for those of you that know anything about, about aeroscience, um, we do not have a working theory of lift. So, so we do not have a first principles understanding of why planes fly, why airfoils work. So what we do have is we do have a hundred years worth of experience in computing things, right? And, and we have a lot of empirical and experimental knowledge, uh, but basically the two most commonly posited theories uh, for what lift is and why it occurs are demonstrably wrong. Um, and so, uh, so this is another interesting, just, I don't know, out there thing is like, we, we fly in planes. We are very sure that they work. Uh, but if you are asked to describe what from a physics perspective is happening, your guess is as good as mine. It probably has something to do with the boundary layer, but that's all I'll say. I think your guess is probably a little bit better than mine, but uh, yeah. Um, do you have a favorite type of bird? That's something I wanted to know, which is obviously off topic, but. <laughs> um, we, there's two categories, right? There's the, there's the ev everyday birds that are like residents uh that are just around and then there's a mig migratory birds and so uh for the residents i i really like the tufted titmouse um uh, he's a little cute guy that hangs upside down uh and he's a close relative of the chickadee um and they're just fun and playful and they like to show off so like when you see them and they see you they don't run away um but then uh for the migratory birds i'm colorblind and so my wife uh, really uh, like she loves all these red like scarlet tanagers and some of these reds that have lots of green and lots of, of red. And I'm just like, I, I don't see them. So so I don't know if I have a favorite, but I, those aren't my favorite because I can't see them. <laughs>
I got a question. Uh, I think this is one of the questions in the list that we collected from people uh, to, to, to forward those to you. Um, so I personally use uh, Wolfram Mathematica for you know, making these simulations and then there's the demonstration project and everything. And obviously there's the MATLAB version of that. I used to use MATLAB when I was in Canada working with Kirsten because Kirsten loves MATLAB and which I like, you have all the control package and everything, those two boxes available for you. So what's, what's your take on that? Like, what do you use exactly with, with your students or by yourself, you know? I would say what I use is students. <laughs> um, they're, they're the real computers. Uh, no, uh, so like I'm, I'm proficient in modifying and reading code in Python and MATLAB. I don't produce code in either. And, and to be, I was joking before, but I'll be honest now. So like going through grad school, like I didn't do any coding, right? Like, and I don't have a coding background. I took one Java course in college. Um, and so, so numerics is definitely not my, my thing. And I'm sort of the last relic of an old era where you could still get an applied mathematics job without explicitly being able to teach, let's say a course, a course in, in Python or MATLAB. Um, so, so to the honest answer to the question is I realized uh, about five, six years ago that my only hope of, of legitimately getting funding and actually, uh, you know, remaining relevant uh, was to make sure that I, I had colleagues that could do the simulation. And to be fair, I do a lot of modeling. Um, and, and so what I like to think of myself as a, a true applied mathematician, like I have collaborators who are engineers, I have collaborators who are true computational scientists. Uh, and, you know, I do my analysis and modeling thing, but, but really each of those sort of reinforces the other, but not all of the people I collaborate with have all of those skills. Uh, and, and I know like for you, uh, uh, I think you, you can do a little bit of all of them, but still I'm assuming like your control background is your strongest, right? And, or maybe not, but I just like for me, like what I actually know is differential equations and everything else I'm just faking. <laughs> I have an engineering background too. So I, I, oh, I try right. to use those skills from, you know, back, you know. And yeah, yeah, I misspoke. I, I master's program and stuff, but yeah, that, that's pretty good. Uh, so you yourself, do you, do you, you, I mean, you said you were joking, but are you yourself using Python or, uh, yeah, so we, the codes, the codes that we, mm -hmm. we work with, with like what, what Caitlin, Caitlin is proficient in, in both. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I won't, I don't remember if she has a preference. I think she does, but, um, mm -hmm. but what we, we tend to do is, um, anytime we generate a code in one, uh, just basic, let's say for beam simulation, uh, mm -hmm. then we'll we'll try and translate it to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, just because when when there's turnover with undergrads, even with grad students, you never know what they're most comfortable in. So we just try and have a repository of every working code uh, in in both. Mm -hmm. We also have some codes. Um, they're they're eigenvalue find codes uh, mm -hmm. that are in. Um, I don't even know what they're in. Caitlin can maybe say, but I like, um, because they're not, they're not dynamic. So they don't need a lot of the sophistication and mm -hmm. basically just large linear algebra problem solves. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, so I don't, I don't have a preference and for anything that's more sophisticated than like finite differences, uh, then uh, we ju I just refer to my finite element buddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I know that uh, Dr. Shugart had a question about turning birding into a mathematical model, which I thought was really cool, uh, and like mathematical ecology. Yeah, yeah, chat, chat it, 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 yeah it's, it's more of a hypothetical, but you know, we, we, we have students interested in mathematical ecology. So how do you think you could take an, you know, take an interest like birding and develop a modeling research project in ecology? If you, oh, you know, I, you know. I gotcha. Well, this isn't something I do, but we have a, a guy at our school uh, and call, maybe not ecology, but just someone who's yeah. interested in birds. Uh, yeah. uh, flocking is a really big problem and emergent, emergent behavior. Uh, and so basically the idea is um, birds are the motivation, but also schools of fish. Uh, and mm -hmm. so um, if you ever watch birds when they move around, right? Like mm -hmm. in some sense, their motion is very prescribed and it's very, um, I don't know, it's very tight and neat, but on the other hand, it seems very chaotic. Uh, and, and so this is like a hundred year old modeling project is just to write down any sort of description, which would give rise to the actual behaviors you observe in like large schools of fish swimming around or large um, flocks of birds uh, flying. And it's actually really active right now because 
it's a simple uh, example of like what I said, emergent behavior, which has now become very popular on the um, artificial intelligence side of things is, you know, you have a simple system with simple rules and pairwise interactions, but then you scale this thing up and you somehow get very, very sophisticated behavior uh, from a very simple set of rules. And the way I understand it, uh, flocking is something that you can basically write down models with just like, um, mm -hmm like systems of linear ODEs, maybe not maybe not linear, but systems of, of ODEs. Um, and you can actually generate some really cool simulations, you know, where you can actually see these sorts of behaviors. So um, I don't, like I said, I don't personally do that, but I think it's really interesting. And it's just one of those things like, for students who've never really thought about what math modeling is, that's a great example, right? You're sitting outside on a beautiful day watching some birds and you're like, wait, how does that work, right? They're not talking to each other. You know, they don't have, they're not telekinetic, right? But somehow there is this very coherent motion. So like, what's, what's going on there? And that's a math problem. Yeah, I, I, I've seen some of that work before, but yeah, but I just, I just figured I'd, I'd just throw out a hypothetical and just see how you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Well, So I personally have a, a question. What do you think the biggest um, misconception about academia is? Obviously, as someone who's a, I'm one of the undergrads here, so I probably have the least experience. What do you think is a big misconception about really working and living in academia? <laughs> uh, <Tough> okay. questions. <laughs> let, 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 let's, let's break this into pieces. So uh, would you, do you want me to answer the question about grad school or after grad school? Um, I guess grad school. Okay, so the, the biggest misconception, I guess I shouldn't speak for everyone, I'll speak for myself. Like I knew it was gonna be hard uh, and I knew it was gonna be you know, a, a test of like endurance, resolve and those things, but I, I was not prepared for, for just how difficult it is because it's difficult in ways that you can't anticipate. So, so you, you, your preparation as an undergraduate even if you're an excellent undergraduate and, and you work really hard and, and even if you've had a lot of life experience, just know that grad school is going to be something that's very different and the ways in which you're going to be challenged are going to be very different. Um, and so the biggest piece of advice I would give about that is just that you want to be open minded, like open minded about what you're interested in, open minded about who you spend your time with. Um, and, it, and it's going to be very work intensive. Um, another sort of misconception I had is I sort of thought I would go to grad school and I would figure out if I was like good at it or not. And I, and I just kept drifting along and I never really figured out if I was good at it. And I think that's, that's one of the things is like imposter syndrome is very real. Um, and uh, everybody feels it from the top down to the bottom. Uh, and, and when you're, when you're in it in, in the moment, I mean, yeah, you just have to be you just have to fully be there. And if you spend all of your time worrying about what job you're going to get, whether you're the best in your class, whether you're ahead or behind, you know, whether your grade was better or worse in measure theory, then, then you know, that'll eat up a lot of your, your time uh, and it'll eat up a lot of your energy and it doesn't really accomplish anything. So, you know, you just put in the work. And at the end of the day, I would say 90% of the people I know that got through grad school, they're just the ones that put in the work. Right, they committed to it and, and did it, and it wasn't much more than that. And a lot of the people that didn't make it, it wasn't because they weren't smart. Some of them were the smartest people I knew. It's because at the end of the day, they they didn't they didn't put their noses down and just do the work. So, I don't know. That's that's the grad school part. And then uh, for for beyond grad school, I mean, there are lots of different ways that can go. So I don't know if there's a single common misconception about you know life in academia. Um, but one thing I could could say is just that. I really like this life and lifestyle, um, but it's not for everyone. So when I talk to my grad students, I try and be very honest about this because for some people, this way of life makes a lot of sense, but for others, it's not a good fit. And so the benefit of, of getting an applied math degree or a math degree, but specifically an applied math degree is that you have some choice, right? Um, and, and so I would contrast that. I don't want to offend any like, you know, philosophy majors or anything like I love philosophy. Um, but to a certain extent, I'm, I'm really glad that I didn't, didn't necessarily get an advanced degree in philosophy because you don't necessarily have a ton of choices at the end of that path. Uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is just how I'm projecting onto it because this is something I thought about, but at least with applied math, when you get to the end of the tunnel, if it turns out academia is not the life for you, you have choice, you have choices. Um, and uh, so I think that's one positive thing. You can always switch from math into something else, uh, but I don't know if that's true about all of the fields, so. I got a question. Um, 
So um, I remember when you graduated in 2011, right? You graduated in uh, 2012. You got your 2012, oh, the year after me, okay. So because we were in the same conferences and stuff. So, so my question is about like you having two different types of uh, skill sets, I think maybe not skill sets with experiences. Uh, one is sort of like a liberal arts college experience that I remember that you were working as an assistant professor and, and then you switched all the way to a, a bigger uh, college, obviously having a PhD program and everything. So how do you compare these two in terms of workload, in terms of how you assess it from your yeah. uh, point of view, you know, because I have my students, you know, some of them say like, oh, I want to be a professor in a big college. And then some say, I'm going to be a professor in a smaller college. So what is that like difference exactly? Do you, do, do you know everybody here? Like, am I allowed to speak freely? <laughs> Uh, uh, no, I, I won't. I won't say anything. But I would just say this is a very important. So I guess this actually leads back to the, the second part of the previous answer, which is academic life. And so the, the the answer is that you really do need to think about what the right fit is for you. And 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 so and a lot of that is is introspection, right? Like, what do you want? Uh, and and there are people like I have very close friends from grad school and they love teaching. Teaching is their life. And so they're perfectly fine with a four, four or four, three teaching load because they're not expected to do anything else. They teach, they love their students. They have small class sizes and that's perfect for them. For me, that wouldn't work. Um, and, and so, and I, I found that out. Um, so, so I, uh, I took that, that job, uh, because I had heard wonderful things about Charleston, South Carolina, um, teaching load was three, three. Um, and there were just some things I didn't really think about. One, I'm not from the South, uh, and neither is my wife. And Charleston was not anything like, I'd lived in Virginia, I'd lived in North Carolina, but something about going that far South and in, not to speak ill of the South or South Carolina or Charleston, Charleston's beautiful. It just wasn't for me. Um, and uh, and the, the structure of the university was also very Southern. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, another piece of advice, uh, and I don't, I will not in any way go political, but I will just say, if you become a public educator in a state that ranks 50th out of 50 in public education, that may not be a good life choice. Um, so uh, that that was uh, an issue. And um, on a more personal side, we had the uh, two body problem because my wife is also an educator. Um, and so we were both at the College of Charleston, but it just yeah it wasn't wasn't a, a good fit so um so it wasn't just about the style of university it was a lot of other personal personal factors but uh, here let's make it positive so the reason why i love umbc so teaching load at umbc is higher than if i was at an r1 right so it, it's it's two two teaching load and there's a lot of advising requirements and things i can't get out of um but i have a lot of choice over what i teach i get to teach the things i like um, and the, there is a research expectation, but it's not crazy, right? Like no one's asking me to, to get, if I, if I don't have grants, no one's knocking on my door and telling me I'm not gonna get tenure or anything like that. Um, so, so that is a really good fit for me because I like teaching, I like research, I like to do a little bit of everything. And I, I, I don't like to have a lot of pressure to be something that I'm not. Um, and that, that's, a, that, that's something I chose. Now, there are people I know who are like big shots. They're really great. And what they want, they want to challenge themselves. So they want that job at the fancy R1 with a lot of cachet. And that's great because if they can, if they can pull it off, then, you know, whatever. But for me, like, I, I always say this, um, I, it's a little bit, well, I wouldn't want a job. You are a big shot too, by the way, just, just so you know. Say again. I said, you are a big shot too. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just so you know, yeah. <laughs> it's all scale dependent, but um, I was just gonna say that, that I don't think I would want a job that's better than the one that I have, <laughs> um, if that makes any sense, so. Avery, do I we have any more questions? Four, yeah. So if we have any okay. final, final question, check. <laughs> I think we asked all of the questions uh, that we had in the list. I asked my personal question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. This is a really lively, you have a great little group here. And I was surprised because most of the time when I've done undergraduate talks, it's like the three people in the math club. Um, so <laughs> you were um, expecting more people, though, by the way. I don't know what happened. But oh, no, this was like, yeah, 20 great. plus or 30, 30 plus, sometimes 10 plus, depending on the, the time of the semester, though. But yeah. that was a wonderful talk, by the way. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, is that okay if we share this video in our website?
Yeah, I don't think I said anything too bad. And no, nothing confidential, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah. So let's thank the speaker again, and and I think that's the end of the session. I have to see you again, Justin, maybe for another talk, maybe for a colloquium talk. Maybe yeah. your student is going to give a talk to us. Who knows, uh, Caitlin? Right? <laughs> oh, yeah, Caitlin turned her camera off. Hi. Hello. Yeah, maybe. Sorry, I was eating yeah. food, so I didn't want to be eating. Are you a master's student or PhD student, Caitlin? I'm an undergraduate student, actually. Undergraduate. Ooh, mm -hmm. okay. Wow. Once you get into the master's program, once you uh, have something to present, yeah, we will uh, be happy to have you uh, giving a talk in our department. So, all right. I think that's the end of the session. Let's end it. Let's uh, thank again. Yeah, thank see you. you. <laughs> have a good Friday. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking with us.